Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Experience. We have a special show for you today. We are interviewing the interviewer, Miss Nora Yolis Young. Hi, Nora. Hi, Carrie. I'm so, so happy that you're doing this. This is really a fun switcheroo. Well, I think that, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out where, where the eyeballs are. Um, I think that we need to know more about you. Um, you are so incredibly fabulous and there's so much to you. Um, you are always asking us the questions. So now we decided that you need to be in the hot seat. That sounds awesome. I, I it, you know, you and Tiffany um, are both the wonderful hostesses of the um, Joyride show. And mm -hmm. we're all part of the Joy Tribe. And yeah. when um, I was interviewing you two a, a, a months ago, um, this was offered and I think it's a great idea because I just want to share with my audience a little bit more about my crazy life and um, how I've gotten to where I, I am now. And so if you guys have any questions about uh, me after the show, feel free to, to um, you know, write them down below the description box in the comments and we'll we'll answer them as appropriate but for today we're just gonna get to brass tacks and so this beautiful lovely mama is gonna be the one asking questions yay which i love to ask the questions so this is a natural thing i know when i'm on the other end of it it's like oh really you want to hear what i have to say about this that's not true Anyway. <laughs> well, and I also just have to point out to everybody that Carrie has like the coolest wallpaper in, in, in that's in your solarium and it's super awesome. I, I like, can I steal that wall? <laughs> yeah, of course you can steal this wall. We'll do a Photoshop version and then, yeah, of course. Yeah, this Such is, but wall. it's been a really hard time to match anything else with this. <laughs> that's been fun. All right, let's get to it. So Yay! I, Okay, so it was a really dark, rainy day back in 19. No, I'm kidding. Um, you are, the more I know about you, and I'm so privileged that, that I have spent a lot of time with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, I'm just always amazed. And there was something that really, really stuck with me that we spoke about um, a while back, about your path in your journey and how even as a young one, you were searching and you, you, you kind of came in with that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we're all born into this crazy physical reality with um, certain circumstances. And I, I had a really, uh, I mean, I can't complain. I, I had an awesome circumstance. I was born in Hawaii and, um, you know, my father was training to be a doctor and my mom was a housewife and they were both from Detroit and, you know, decided, hey, let's go to Hawaii and start a life there. And so that was my start. And so the energies of the Pacific Ocean are a huge influence in who I am, I would say. Um, and yeah, you know, you know, we didn't stay in Hawaii immediately. Um, I, we didn't stay, I, we were, I was born there, I have a twin brother, older sister, moved back to the mainland for a few years, and then went back to Hawaii, but the, those early developmental years in my life were, I think, looking back on them, super um, important for me to understand um, as I went through my awakening because she was the essential me. So w when you say that, when, so what do you, what, what do you feel really, really made an imprint on your soul? I mean, what, what part, I mean, I can just imagine the beauty and the ocean and just the land itself, I'm sure sings. I mean, don't they say that it's not Mount Shasta, it's the other one. It's the, I mean, there's like a huge. Haleakala? in Haleakala yeah. on Maui. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't there yet. I think the energies of Hawaii, and if anybody's ever been there, um, the, the atmosphere there is, it's in, I mean, it's truly in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It is a little bit of a trip when you're just looking out at the expanse of the ocean and you're like, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and that's uh, crazy. So you get all of the weather, you can see for miles, like you, you get, I think anywhere where you can see weather for miles, you get a sense of how weather comes in. Um, and just the, the, the moisture in the air, it, it, 
it kisses your skin. So there's a real visceral experience, I think, to being in Hawaii. Um, and I'm a twin. And I think being a twin is a huge part of who I am as well, because um, I had a partner, even in the womb. And although he and I are incredibly uh, different, he's, he's male and I'm female, so we're fraternal twins. Um, and we're, I, you know, I was born in the 70s. And so it was a time where parents were pretty hands off. Um, you know, we just sort of had our run of the place and my mom describes like potty training. Yeah, you just ran around naked and when you peed on the floor, you know, I just said next time do that in the toilet. Okay. And apparently that's that. Um, pretty easy. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all like the, uh, the rigid hovering that is expected of parents now, but yeah, like naked running around on the beach and that stuff. But we were in Texas actually. Um, when I was a toddler, my, we, we hopped over to California while my dad finished residency. And then we went to uh, Victoria, Texas until about the age of six. So just finished kindergarten. And then my father dreadfully wanted to get back to, he just like could not handle Texas. And my parents were having issues. Um, and so he joined the military so that he could be stationed so we could all be stationed back in uh, Hawaii. And so we, he was at, uh, he was a doctor at Tripler Army Medical Hospital, which is a pink hospital, you guys, a pink army hospital, huge on Oahu. You know, it's sort of like, you think of homophobia and the military, but they did have a pink hospital. Okay. Cool. Just kidding. Um, but he was, he's, um, he, he was there mandatory and then he was done. And so we were there. So that brought us there. And then we moved to Maui and that's where I grew up, you know, the rest of the time. So, so when did you start feeling like you, yeah, there might be something more to this? I mean, was that always there or did you, it was there like a defining incident? Well, I think I, I had a sense that I could achieve anything at a very young age. Um, like I taught myself how to swim. I just did not want to be, I was three and I, and we were in Texas at this point and I was not going to use a stinking floaty anymore. And so, <laughs> and I saw everybody swimming freely and I knew that I wanted that sensation. I think I thought I was a mermaid um, pretty distinctly for many, many years. So I thought I could breathe in the water. Um, maybe you were, yeah, I, I have no doubt. Someone broke it to me at some point. I was devastated that I wasn't a mermaid and I was just <laughs> like, wait, how, how, what? They're you like, you can't breathe, in the, breathe in the water. What? But I've been doing it. I mean, yeah, They're like you can't breathe in the water. I'm like, uh, really? No, I've been doing that. I thought so, you know, we don't know the kid memories. Um, I, I, I have very clear recollections of being blissfully happy and thinking I was the bomb without reservation. And, but I do remember probably around four or five um, trying to explain some of the clever, brilliant things that I was coming up with as a kid and trying to explain them to my family and them going, uh, no, don't understand. For, for example? Well, I remember figuring out while making a mud pie, mud, you know, people had told me mud, kids make mud pies, so I had to go check that out. Um, so I, I, I was like, okay, I'm making mud pies, this is fun. But as I was doing that, I must have been a little bit in a trance, and I remember like it dawning on me, oh my gosh, what if everybody is being taught that a color is like say blue this is blue but they're actually seeing a different color i've had that feeling yes. right i think other people have had that yeah like we're being trained to all think that the same color is a, that same color but maybe we're all seeing it differently like we're interpreting the vibration differently and mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I thought that i was just so uh, it was a genius revelation and i you know proudly you know announced to my family that i had come up with something very very ingenious and they um they're like they didn't 
whatever. Okay. Like nice, nice. Good girl. That actually is pretty ingenious. I mean, for you to be outside the spectrum looking in and coming up with this idea of now, wait, who wrote the rules? Who, who, Oh, that's cool. That is really cool. Well, and I guess it wasn't meant for me to have that kind of confidence because it was maybe a part of my soul path to break that down and have doubt. Cause I would also see these really intricate stories in the, in the clouds. I was such a dreamy kid and I would get knocked out and, you know, so sort of like, Oh yes, dreamer girl, but you know, like come, come back out of the clouds. Um, and I just remember being like, why would anyone think that that was not absolutely incredible and amazing? You know, I just remember just being confused by like, I'm totally awesome, but they're trying to tell me that I'm not. And that, and I started to sink in slowly, you know, like I, like I started thinking less of myself. And then when we went to Hawaii, you know, six years old entering first grade, um totally different cultural vibe from texas um and and i you know you have to sort of like the the it's different and and so just having to figure it out um i still felt really really i remember feeling really happy it was a very adventurous time and we lived really close to the beach so it was an like that that's where i was i was on the beach playing and swimming and that was incredible so i just think that that was really really a privileged idyllic life um there started to be some uh i think discomfort in the relationship with my parents like in a really intense way and so there was there was stuff there was like human real human like drama um as the relationship from with my parents started to fall apart and it took many years um for that to actually conclude um but there was a lot of stress i remember my mom having long periods of illness where she had vertigo and she was just in bed um and uh i remember she went on a long trip for like a month and my i think my father was you know he was somewhat checked out i mean and these like i say all of this with love because i i i have D- done a lot of work around this and so it's I don't hold any um resentment I've forgotten forgiven everybody and it's all just part of the the roles that are played in this particular lifetime that I'm in um but we made it to Maui in 81 and my dad started his own business and worked for Maui Memorial Hospital as a pathologist and I think that was an important part of my upbringing as well just the idea of death um and that may sound morbid, but you know, when I was four or five, I was obsessed with ghost stories and I'll backtrack a little. I, uh, my mom had seen ghosts before and she had told us about ghost stories. And I, I just thought that was the coolest thing. And, but she was very, um, you know, spiritualists, uh, spiritualism became really big in the turn of the century. And yeah. I think that had a huge impact um, I'm no historian, but, uh, you know, my mom comes from a working class community in Michigan and it seemed like there were a lot of women having seances there. And I don't think that that was uncommon, um, in the United States. And I, I certainly know in England, there was a lot of that too. And we have a lot of English heritage. So I, I don't, I don't know you know, I think that definitely had an influence because there wasn't a huge dogmatic religious tradition in my family. And and I have, my father was Jewish, but he was not practicing. So there, you know, my parents had a mixed marriage um, religiously. And so we learned some cultural uh, things, but there was not like a, a strict practice of any sort. There's a lot of openness. Hawaiian and Judaism. That's an interesting, that's an interesting mix. Yeah, because they're yeah. both very strong cultures, you know, very yeah. identifiably strong. Yeah, so, yeah. So your mom now did she ever? Did you ever walk in and she was having a seance, or I mean, did she ever? Did you ever see that? No, there were always stories, but she there, occasionally she would uh, have sort of a, a sensation of pressure on her chest, and she'd say, "Oh, something stuck with me," or that she would talk about how she had been 
um, something had intervened, like put her foot on the brake if, if she was in traffic and needed to brake and someone would just put her foot on the brake and save her. Cool. Yeah. And she had an experience at, um, on Gettysburg when she and my father were, ha I think she was pregnant with my sister and she had woken up and there were um, Gettysburg soldiers in her room. Oh, wow. And this cool. was, yeah. And she had told us this as a kid, cause I was so fascinated by ghost stories and, um, and she tried to communicate with them telepathically, like in whatever way she sort of intuitively try could, and she couldn't connect with them. She had no ability to connect with them and, and she couldn't wake up my father either. And so it was just kind of, you know, she's, she's always had this really easy connection with spirit, but, um, no real interest to connect beyond that, which is mm -hmm. interesting. I mean, I could get into it more, but um, it, you know, it's a long trajectory. Um, but it influenced me. And then when I was five years old in Texas, we, our house was some. It was haunted, and um, and we you'd hear weird stuff, and there were you know all kinds of stories. But the thing that I what that really impacted my life was one night in the middle of the night a being of light um, came into my awareness. And in my child mind, I saw it out on the sidewalk outside. And I, um, I woke everybody up and I was like, it's out there, it's out there. And I called it my light man. And, and I had no, it was difficult for me to explain that it was just a being shaped like a person, but of light. And it felt like a guide. It felt very supportive and like, I like a nodding, like everything, like I'm here, I, you're not alone. And it was very reassuring, but I also felt like in my child mind, in my human mind, it was really difficult for me to explain it to people. So I just called it my light man and I called it a ghost. And now I get that it was a guide and that I was seeing it in my third eye, which is why I tried to wake up my brother and he couldn't see it. Um, Oh, yeah, I woke him up and he couldn't see it. And so that was my first um, real conscious experience with non-physical when you I was five. Four. Yeah, I was wow. five years old. Well, we're, we're so open when we're four and five years old. And then it, 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 I don't think that it really progressed much in that time. And I became much more concretized in the uh, sort of scientific. Did you just make up that word? No, it's a real word. <laughs> I know, I love your words. You're the best words. But you know, it's interesting though. I, I think you're right. And I, but I also think that if you're open, you come in open and then it's closed down oftentimes. But if you're, but there are some people that come in not open at all. And, right, like that's not their jam. Right, exactly. And so um, it sounds like your brother, so, okay, so you have a mother that's, that's artistic, that's open, that made it, a fun thing, an exciting thing. You have a father that is is this doctor, very scientific. So you really kind of have the best of both worlds. Yeah, happening. yeah. You you grew up in that. Yeah. Um, and and I love that. When it comes to our kids, I think to create. I mean, you never know where they will end up. I mean, we could sit and push them and push them and push them in one way, and then and they'll go in that way, and then all of a sudden they'll go this way. You know, and 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 so you never really know. So did you feel like you fit in as no. you grew up? I mean, with your family? Uh, no, I felt misunderstood. And I think that must have been part of what my soul experience needed to happen because I, like looking back, I don't know what either parent could have said to make me feel like I fit in. It may have just been a social thing. Um, my father uh, would always refer to me as the creative kid. And so I took that really personally that I wasn't, I didn't have a scientific mind. So then I had a chip on my shoulder. I was like, I'm going to show you. And so I think there was this whole like expectation that I was going to prove that I was a scientist and um, which is why in college I, um, I, you know, I was terrified of, of the actual like math and science, like actual like mainstream um, core math and science. I wasn't really great at that. And had I known that I could have gotten a lot of help and got through it just fine, I would have done it and probably have been a doctor. But I went, um, I fell in love with archaeology. And so that was more of a social science 
fell in love with archaeology. And I, there was a real passion within me to try and make a connection to understand that animation of the human body process. What I, I didn't even know it was learning to connect with the soul. I just was like, I got to go for this somehow. I have to somehow get into this. And archaeology was sort of my entry into that. And I, um, and we can talk about it more a little later. Well, I, I love this because I think that, um, I think to be clear, when you say that, you mean like the spark of life, like what animates the body, right? Yeah. I mean, th I, we've heard, I think it was on channeling Eric, um, they were saying that, that, that uh, what's his face? England, Mur Jack, Jack the Ripper. The Ripper. Mm -hmm. That's what he was actually, he wanted to find that too, that spark. Like, oh, what yeah, is that yeah. spark? Yeah, yeah, I think I saw that okay. one. And so that's, I think that that is such a, like what animates, I mean, that's what, that's what, uh, what's his face? Um, oh, like the little knobs right here. Oh, the man. Frankenstein. I, yeah. I mean, that's what they were doing with that too, you know, and Frank and Weenie and all of that. I think we are so <laughs> intrigued by that. But now at the time, now didn't you actually work in a morgue or, or. Yeah. So, so, and I went to a really awesome school in Southern California called University of Redlands, the Johnston Center. So Johnston Center is where all the freaks of the school uh, reside, freaks in the most loving way. But it, you, you uh, like the school, you live and learn there and you design your own curriculum. And oh. um, so, and, and a lot of the professors um, have offices within the dorm. So you, you really have this live learning experience and the, and the, the kids there totally intelligent and um the the passion of youth man the 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 19 20 21 year old uh just oh the fire i'm gonna change the world I'm yeah gonna change. <laughs> and just like railing just railing against or you know but just so many amazing um things but I, you know basically if you could find somebody to sponsor you which meant okay i'll i'll um, give you the information you need and sign off on this through the registrar, um, you could take a class, an independent study. So I asked my dad's partner, who was a forensic pathologist on Maui, um, if he would be willing to sponsor a summer internship um, at Maui Memorial Hospital doing medical legal investigation of death. And so... <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> oh my gosh. It was intense, man. Last? Huh? How long did you last? I would think that would be. A I tough lasted one too. probably for about six autopsies. Um, I still remember the name of the first person. Um, I'll respect the family and not say, but I remember her dearly. And it was a crazy time because Maui's tiny. There's not a lot of uh, people there, and there. You know, when people die on Maui, you, you hear about it. And crazily enough, uh, friends of mine who own this cafe called Stella Blues, um, you know, they, they're friends. And this couple, this tourist couple was having a vacation in Hawaii, having breakfast. And apparently some guy had just found out that he was HIV positive and was angry. So he drove, he decided, oh, I'm going to drive my Jeep into this cafe and he killed this woman and her husband was upstairs in the hospital recovering and they're tourists could you imagine how devastating oh, wow yeah. but her energy was so present in the room and I was just like whoa and I don't know you know my like I don't want to be graphic but I will tell you like my like I'm pretty tough like I, I've done I was an EMT and I, I didn't work on a rig but I worked with like rave kids who OD'd and stuff and I, like, I'm tough. I can handle sort of gruesome stuff. I think just having a dad that's a doctor, you kind of get tough. And um, boy, though, an autopsy, guys, like, especially if you're empathic or sensitive, it is intense. It's much more violent than anything I could have imagined. It's not like I had pictures of Quincy in my head. Remember that old show? <laughs> and it was just like, yeah. you know, la, 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 a little scientific and then looking in a microscope or, you know, like. You know, I don't know what I had in mind, but it was just like, oh, oh my gosh, you're doing, like, it's like, it's like what you do to deers. I mean, they, it's gutting a person, basically. You're taking every, or, and I don't need to get well, so graphic, but. 
But, you know, I remember going, and I'm wondering if you felt this way. I, re I remember going when my grandfather died. I just remember my thought always when someone crosses is you were just here. Yeah. Like you were just animating that body. You were it's just too here. weird, right? Like Where anybody who's seen a person go, it, they're really gone. It's like, hello? They're so not there, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember seeing a dead body in, a, in an accident when I was with some friends and just, it's almost like the atmosphere changes, you know? Well, it there's does. Like, it becomes, yeah. It, what they're showing me is it becomes electric. It's like this, it, because there's a portal and they have to cross. I mean, you still have that barrier that you have to go through. Oh, that really makes it's, sense. Cause it's almost like when you put a shell to your ear, there's like this, mm -hmm. as that's yeah, this, the ocean. Yeah. That, that's, that's interesting that you say that. Cause I, there's like, Oh my gosh, that person is is gone now, and you could just, it's it's it, it it always was like, what is going on here? Where is that going? You know, and my father, he he ended up passing away in uh, two thousand and three, and that was a, I think a, a powerful part. Of, it was during my Saturn return, so I was thirty thirty one, um, and he died of cancer, um, and I have so much to say about that, but being present through his final days was the most powerful, beautiful, heart-wrenching experience of my life. Like huge, huge, intense experience and um, sort of recovering back into humanity, like just regular everyday uh, interactions felt weird because when, when a person's dying, every bit of eye contact that you make with them has meaning every nod every gesture is just like you want to get as much as you can out of that experience so it's just super intense and i think i'm one of those people that likes really intense experiences really yeah. connected experiences and um and i guess i want people to know too like don't be ashamed of needing intense connections i mean we human beings are living in this physical body and i think we're trying to figure out how to be more deeply connected and we do have this sort of meat suit that we're managing um that we're it's a little awkward for our energy it's heavy and i hear that in session all the time you know it is yeah yeah it is it is and, and it, it is it is i mean you're constantly having to worry about the output the input the system the waste system that you know they're all these systems and um okay so so if we go back um and i would i do want to go back to your dad because i think that was a profound thing for you um as it is for anyone and it's funny because uh, something i want to talk about is how we know what we know yet as humans we still are devastated by death even though we know that i don't know it's just such an interesting it's like okay we agree as humans to be a hundred percent human and and so when we lose another human it, it devastates us. But then there's that other side of us that it's like, oh, I know where we're going. You know, I'm going to see you tomorrow, basically. I mean, it's just such a nano. It's so true. It's, it's, it's like, you can't have both. Like you, it's like when you're, when you're grieving, you're in that human experience, but when you're connecting with their spirit, it's, you're totally free of that grief. So um, I think in order to have that experience, you have to have a lighter um, vibrational energy that's more allowing, you know? Um, yep. yeah, yeah. But I, but I think too, that when you have the spirit side, when we connect with that side, it's our spirit that connects with them, yeah. you know, and, and the human is our human connects with, connects mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. the human side. So, so it's interesting how you can walk with a foot in both worlds, yet you still have to feel it as a human you, you have to otherwise you don't you don't process and I say that um I've never lost I mean I've lost people close but not like grandparents but not parents I still have a grandmother still alive and I'm 40 whatever I mean it, it is it's it's incredible okay That's so awesome that great longevity so, genes yeah yeah really seriously well we were they're also very young when they had kids um which doesn't hurt but it is so you are so you do this program you become an archaeologist and you actually went on digs. I mean, most of the folks that I know, that was like their, their stepping stone into law school. <laughs> you know, it's like- Archaeology you know, was? No, anthropology. Oh, anthropology. Yeah, but, it, but it's interesting how you don't actually meet people that really do that. 
or at least not in my world. And so did you actually? Yeah, what? my very first, well, my first dig was at, at Calico Early Man's site, which is in um, Barstow, but that's, I, uh, that's not the greatest site. Um, my, then I went to Belize with a, um, a field school um, through, uh, um, gosh, I don't even remember the name of it. It's in 94, um, where we excavated, um, Maya ruins there. Like there was a Maya city there. Um, I've been to Israel and worked with mm -hmm. Harvard, um, at a place called Ashkelon, which was incredible. Um, and then I, I got a job. My first real like paying job was in Hawaii. Um, and I was a, um, I, you know, I worked for contract archaeologists and that's for cultural resource management. So when they're building places in culturally significant sites, you have to monitor and make sure that they don't, you know, destroy anything. So it's a pretty political job. I was totally low on the, on the, totem pole so I didn't have any of the politics playing out in my experience but what did happen was uh, in Honolulu my first experience with being interacted with through uh, bones bones I was fascinated by bones again I was like trying to get into that sort of energy of things and sure enough we had a, a you know in Hawaii some land had been sold and they were building a a high rise and apparently it had been a um uh a, gr a grave site and someone like had a just burial site it had been a burial site and they just plucked off the tombstones and sold the land oh my gosh this is poltergeist and it's just like poltergeist so um that's where they have the um the abc kgmb i think that's what it is um studios it's like a pink building in honolulu on king street and so we excavated the burials and then i was responsible for documenting all of the materials and so um all of the the burials were laid out and i was going through the artifacts cleaning them documenting them and when i got to this one burial it was clearly the burial of a child um and i you know it was after lunch i was probably a little uh sleepy and um, I was just sort of spacey and all of a sudden this like electrical shock went into my arms and like, zzz, I was like, oh my gosh, freaky. And I put them down and I just sort of, you were holding um, the bones. I was, I was holding that. I wasn't even holding bones. I was holding artifacts. They were like a marble kids toys from this burial. And um, they zapped me. And I was like, uh, and then I got really ill. I did. I, and then my eyesight went like I couldn't, everything lost focus and I couldn't see. Um, and wow. it was really bizarre. And I had to have my mom come and pick me up from work because I couldn't drive home. And that whole night, uh, you know, I went home and I just rested and I was in kind of a twilight state. And I think I intuitively just knew that I had to connect with this energy and I connected with the energy of a little boy. I gave him a name. I, I and I we made peace with this whole thing. I just said, you know, this is totally done out of respect, and I I mean you no harm. You know, I'm coming from a place of love. Fast forward, you know, I felt better. My eyesight came back. Fast forward, um, at least a month or two and I'm working now I've gone through all of the burials with the artifacts and now I'm working on the bones documenting the bones and and you know uh, cataloging them and again I was at the same burial without noting the number on, of the burial and I I got zapped again <laughs> it's probably his mother well you know what was funny about it it was much more lighthearted, and i was alone in the lab and i could feel the energy of this little boy running around and he blew on my neck it was totally playful and playing. wonderful yeah and so that was incredible uh, that was an incredible that and i you know but what we do is i guess when we're re not ready to awaken we just sort of put that in our memory banks okay there it is and um um but i it was a it was a powerful experience for me um and i'm you know i guess the reason i even bring any of these things up is because this show is about awakening and people's experience with awakening and so sometimes it's incremental 
Um, and for me, it was very, like, I, I think I was very, it was in a very open family dynamic um, that allowed awakening, but the, the planet ne wasn't necessarily ready for awakening. It wasn't time yet. So oh, there are these sort of time release moments where it's like, oh, that can happen. Oh, and that can happen. And that sort of feeds the sort of the whole picture. And then when it's time, it starts to blossom, I guess. Well, I think they're seeds. I think, yeah. I think there's seeds that just get planted. And I think that, I mean, it's sort of that, what does Tiffany always say um, on joyriding? Like you're gonna turn on the light switch, electricity's going to be there, whether you believe it or not. And I think your, your veil was very thin to begin with. So those things just would pop through whether you wanted them to or not. Yeah, yeah. And, I think I wanted them. I, I, I fully, uh, I think I agreed to every single bit of this. Thing. <laughs> and I also, I want to, I do want to say too, like that was my, I, that was early adulthood, but my adolescent years were really painful for me. Like I just, and, and I'm not saying this to complain. I just, you know, I'm a very big Abraham Hicks fan. And I do think that we do have contrast in our lives to uh, use as a foundation to work from. And I think that my big time contrast came you know, started when my parents split up and I was a very awkward teen who, who isn't, but I just, you know, my parents were splitting up. Um, I was not considered someone that the boys were interested in and they, I, they were actually pretty mean to me. I was, I was a late bloomer too. So I, and I had this sort of, I felt like Shrek, you know, I felt like, mm, um, very uh -huh. awkward. Uh, hey, and I'm, you know, it was, it, it's all good now, but it was a painful time. And so I just want to put it out there to, to anybody who can relate to this. Like it doesn't need to define you. Just use it as a stepping stone to, to step from and, and know that, you know, we all can have humbling <laughs> experiences that, you know, I had boys tell me, I wish you were dead, you know, like you, you're ugly. I hate you, you know, just like, just, you know, I, but I had the same thing. I, I had a mullet and glasses that were that thick. And I mean, I, I, but I've always said, if I had a daughter, I have three boys and, and if I had a daughter, I would want her to be homely <laughs> until about 20, because I think that you nurture curiosity and, and look, it is different when you're cute. The world responds to you differently. It, when you're, I mean, I have, topped out over 200 pounds with my kids and you carry that weight for a while after totally yeah. different it is yeah. totally different so I yeah. think that when you're when you're I don't know I think that you you cultivate other things humor intellect um I don't know I just think that if you ride on that exactly. <laughs> Get, getting your own we, stuff like not can you go get this for me or right, uh, right. <laughs> so, so I think that there that there is a lot of fertile ground in that I mean I always say that oh, for the, sure the shit is flowers grow. Right. Know? And I think when we are in spirit planning for our lifetimes, we're considering what are the lessons that we want, the goals. I mean, maybe even not lessons. Lesson is, is indicative of like coming with a real plan to learn something. We will learn no matter what we do as souls being on the physical yeah. plane. Um, but the goals, you know, we'll have different goals each lifetime and our previous lifetimes will inform the goals that we have in the current lifetime. And so I think in this one, you know, having a twin brother, how I relate to people, the, the sensitivities that I have, like, so boundarylessness was kind of a thing for me. Like I could get into people's shit really easily because I didn't know that, that sort of, I, I wasn't an individuated person. To, in right. my own mind. And I had to sort of do that work, at, which enabled me to have better relationships with people um, in, in that way. But I think too, as a soul, um, there is the distinct individuated aspect, but then there's instantaneous merging upon um, connecting. And, that's, and, and it doesn't feel invasive in the spirit world, but it certainly feels invasive here. And so that right. was, that was, um, something I needed to figure out. And it what really wasn't until I was in my late twenties where guys were just like, dude, get, get out, you know, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, what? This is what you do. This is what love looks like. <laughs> but, there, but that's a good point because I would think that when you share a womb, when you have a womb mate, sorry, bad, that it is an animal. But <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you have that, when there's an absence of a person in your energetic space, it probably feels lonely or it feels like there's something missing. There's a hole to fill. There's that void energy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, so, and, and you don't have to be a twin to know that feeling because you and I have talked yeah. about that. And um, I think sensitive people and energetic masters have that issue often because you can blend energy so well and read energy. And in your human form, sometimes you don't even realize what a master you are at that. And then you're just doing it. And then mm -hmm you don't have anything to juxtapose or compare to until you start having more awakening and awareness and realize, oh, I'm not like everybody else. Everybody else is doing it a little bit differently than me. And that's where it, be, it, get, it starts to get really fun because then you can really start to fine tune your, your special sauce. Your special sauce, that is, so, <laughs> that is your term. Oh man, so, so, there's just so much. So how, okay. So you were, you went on the different digs. So how did you transition from that into, into the next phase into becoming what was the next phase? Yeah. Well, um, my dad's illness was a big one. Um, I was doing archeology span at a time when there, I, and I was ended up in the Bay area. So I was doing archeology span in the Bay area, which was awesome. Um, and in some great places, by the way. Yeah. Oh, dude, we had some really cool stuff. I was excavating in downtown San Francisco when September 11th happened. I, we were um, digging a, a gold rush era ship literally right next to the uh, Trans America Tower and we were evacuated. But it was like, dude, we're digging a ship up out of downtown San Francisco. That was really epic. And it wasn't, it wasn't too far after that. Like I realized that day um you know when all that craziness was going down that day all i cared about was a head count of my loved ones right exactly. and then and it, and it occurred to me that I, my occupation was stuff it was collecting documenting and storing stuff it was cool stuff but it was just stuff and i realized at that point that i needed to be more intimately involved with humanity um, Not yeah. the ghosts of humanity, and, and you know that's that. There's something. Well, when you and I said that, thanks. Something completely different. I know. I know that feeling. It is. It is, and I get it because you look. You you. I'm sure you feel as you have said, but I'm sure just on a regular basis you felt the energy of the stuff. So you're coming at it from a psychic side, and and also from just the earthly side. But that is profound that you said, okay, you know what? I want to, I want to jump forward and I want to be here and I want to be, I want to be here. I want the There connection. wasn't a clear, it was a, it was a clear realization, but it just started to unfold. What happened is uh, I started to um, go to grad school and I was in a program where, and I don't need to get into the details, but um, I was in the program and then my father was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and it had spread throughout his body. It was kidney cancer that, that he had already had brain metastases. And I realized that, that that school was really just me sensing this change coming because what I was studying was palliative care. <laughs> Inter oh, wow. multidis multidisciplinary palli palliative care. So once I saw that, I realized that I didn't actually need to be there. Um, but I did need the student loan so I could go back and forth to Hawaii. So I finally just paid that sucker off. Um, Yay! <laughs> um, but two and a half years of being dedicated to just going to Hawaii if my father really needed me or elsewhere he went, you know, to Houston to MD Anderson for surgeries and stuff. He didn't have an interest in alternative healing at all. But I, you know, the, the experience of, of being with a family member who is going through illness and death, I love what Abraham says about that is, you know, 
soul, you know, spirit energy, soul energy doesn't, the people who are dying, they don't need the illness, but the people who are here do because um, they need a way of starting to, to let them go. To detach. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, my father died when he was 60. And so he was young and it, it was tragic. It was really tragic, but I've connected with him since he's passed. And when he was dying, actually, like I had fallen asleep and um, we were all gathered at his house and it was early, early in the morning. And I saw in my dream, his spirit leaving, like coming down the hallway and we weren't allowed to be in the room with him because his wife really wanted to be the one with him. And so he, and he knew that I really wanted, that I needed this experience. And so he gave it to me in dream form. And I opened the door in my dream to let his spirit leave. And it just sort of drifted out and then off into the sky. And then I woke up really suddenly and I ran to his room to see if he was still, like if he had died. I, I had just seen his soul leave. <laughs> but his body was still alive. So that was confusing for me. And now, now I understand that that happens, but I didn't understand that then, but he had given me a huge gift that day. And, um, and I was the only kid that actually wanted to be um, having that sort of spiritual um, dynamic with him. We would talk about death when, before he died and he was very uncomfortable with dying, but he and I had some very candid discussions about it. And that's just something that is part of who I am. And, and I am so appreciative that he got to do that, um, that I got to do that with him. And he, that he that didn't allow that. Yeah. That he, he let me. It. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a gift. What a gift for both of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know he's popped in a couple of times and, and he is, yeah, he's a, he's an incredible man. It, it is. So, so I know that we're running out of time for this segment and, and I have a feeling we have three of these, not just two. <laughs> yes, yeah, to be part one. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. what we can do is just have people ask questions too. Um, if there's information about, you know, what they want to know, you go ahead. You're the host, damn it. <laughs> I know, man. No, I, 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 I I think that we need to get the broad strokes because I think, I mean, doing what you do and, and, the hypnosis and how you got to that and how you got to life between lives. I mean, that's how I met you. Um, I, you did my PLR and, and it was, um, well, I guess you did, you know, you're more than that, but it, it is in all you the math. LBL you, too. Yeah. Yeah. I did the LBL. I don't think you did actually. It doesn't matter. So it is, <laughs> I would love to go to, oh my gosh, all of that and, and, and what all is there and what you've learned and what you know to be just absolutely your truth. And, and how it branches off from there and how, how I mean, because you're doing some really pretty phenomenal things Aww, and your gifts are thanks. incredible. No, it, it really is true. I mean, and you are such a way shower. You really are. So, um, so yes, I mean, please ask questions because I think that that, you know, we love, we love those. And we also would love, um, would love to learn more. And, and because I think we're only to about what, 25, 26? Yeah, right. there's, there's a lot. And, and there's so much. I mean, I could... You know, I guess people, if there's in, you know, I can talk about so much of the, I, I, I luckily remember even through the purple haze of my adolescence, um, I remember a lot of the thought processes that help shift my, my direction. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, I mean, I was stalked by a boyfriend for a year. Um, you know, there's so many dynamics that shaped the direction of my life. And I would love to really spend some time too, and talking about how, um, people become healers, how people get into hypnotherapy. Um, exactly. I would re go ahead. Huh? No, 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 I would, no, keep talking. I, that's exactly, I would love to know more about that. Yeah. You know, read, uh, Michael Newton's books, journey of souls, destiny of souls. He has other ones. Those are the, the key primers. Um, my first, I think, book about past life regression was Brian Weiss's book, uh, Many Souls, or Many many Lives, Many Masters. Yeah. Um, and Dolores Cannon's amazing. So just, yeah, just start, like, go to a bookstore, go to a library and just see where you're guided and start opening books and see what turns you on. And I think that is a huge thing because it is, I know that I was so hungry. I just, 
but there are certain things I wanted to read and certain things I didn't, certain things I was just completely not interested in. Later, I became interested. And so I think that you're exactly right. Your soul will guide you. Your, totally. your guides will guide you. Yeah, you got to honor that. Yeah, if yeah, any of your good. friends are telling you, oh, but you got to do this first, just trust your gut, you know? Like, you don't, don't do anything first. Yeah, trust what you think needs to come first. This is, I think that's where we're at in our, in humanity's time line right now is it self-discovery radical right. self-expression and radical self-discovery so go uh, to it that. go to it and just keep listening just keep listening and so anyway well thank you guys for joining us for the part one of probably three shows talking about miss nora and going all into her processes they really are phenomenal and very well thought out so oh thank you sweetie. Right. thank you so much for doing it and i just like i can't tell you how happy it is to see that wallpaper so we have to make sure that same setup happens next time because it just makes me so damn happy okay yeah. so this is broadhurst she passed away in 1971 and we saw it actually my niece found it in a magazine and it took us forever to find out who actually made it we contacted them they're, they're in australia she and they said, sure, we only did that this colorway one time. So if you want, you can, we can do it for you too. And, oh yeah, and you guys, Carrie is, a, she, she doesn't tell this to everybody, but she's an interior designer. Oh my gosh, she's uh, phenomenal. She's, <laughs> but she's spiritual about it. So if you have like this incredible budget, you may just want to <laughs> drop it. No, no. Okay, well, only celebrities. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> just kidding. You're so funny. I'll all right. I love you all love of you my, too. my, I love you, Carrie. And I love you all of the people who watch my show. Please don't be afraid to ask any questions and let us know what you think. Uh, like it, share it, subscribe click, it, click the bell and we'll put stuff in the description box, but thank you so much for tuning in. Love you all. Thanks, guys. See you later.